Hello there, how are you doing? And welcome to another tutorial or demonstration, painting demonstration. This painting is of a view from outside my studio using a telescopic lens, looking back east toward the National, uh, sorry, Angeles National Forest. And I'm painting on a 24 inch square canvas. It's not linen, it's canvas, and I've primed it with a couple of layers of gesso. I just really wanted a more loose brush free feel to it. So I went in and put on two, I think maybe two or three layers of gesso, acrylic gesso beforehand, and left some of the texture. I've been working on just a variety of different textures, some vertical and horizontal brush strokes. And on this particular occasion, I just went kind of with random brush strokes because I like that texture underneath. It gives me something to respond to. As usual, I'm putting a warm color ground on there to get that tone in the neutral zone, not too white, not too dark using a little bit of odorless mineral spirits with some transparent earth red, which is made by Gamlin, which I sell and endorse at my web store. So if you're interested in what paints I use, you can head over to my web store and I sell them as individual tubes. I sell them as sets. Um, but on this particular occasion, I'm using the earth red with a little bit of... Uh, odorless mineral spirits and I think I used a tiny bit of liquid as well just to help it dry. I'm gonna grid out the canvas ever so loose. I mean I'm not using any paint I'm actually just using the tone ground to get me to grid out that painting. And as you can see by my reference image in the top right because I'm working on a square the dynamic symmetry lines or the armature of the composition neatly separates uh, the, the primary lines there into quarters. So I've put a grid at um, every five inches. How, how big did I say this? Six? Six inches. So a little six inch squares since this is a 24 inch by 24 inch canvas. Um, and when I was preparing my image to make this painting, I adjusted some of the shapes. I elongated it a little bit. I really wanted to get that tree to fit onto some of those diagonals. And I wanted the mountain and distance there to be in that uh, top portion of the grid. Now the lines are called uh, the Baroque diagonal is the diagonal line that extends from the lower left corner to the upper right corner. So if you follow the diagonal from the bottom left right up to the top and then you get the reciprocal line, it's the line that intersects that major diagonal, the major Baroque diagonal at 90 degrees. That's where the blue line on that graph the horizontal and vertical line intersect that point. So that's my grid. And those mountains just lick the top there. There's some diagonals coming down, which can al align with the tree. The hill in the foreground is on a diagonal that goes from the bottom left corner to the center of the right hand side of the image. So there's, and and the horizon or the, the flat line at the bottom then is on the bottom half of the, so not the bottom half, down on that bottom grid. It sits perfectly on that bottom grid. So it does line up a lot with those diagonals. Oops. So yeah, I altered the image in the computer, changed some of the color tones, elongated it to make the tree, uh, the mountains in the background, the primary focus of the painting and the peak in the background actually sits real nice in the center of the image. 
the diagonals that go from the top left, top right corners to the center uh, almost mimic the shape of that that mountain peak in the background. That's what I really liked. Now I'm very, very lucky. You know, I came from Wales, uh, and I, as a kid, I watched cowboy movies, uh, John Wayne movies, and the hills in those old Western movies, and the light in the evening was just something that uh, I'd seen on the big screen, or, or in my case, the little screen. In the black and white screen in my home when I grew up, which became a coloured screen when I was I was very young. Um, I never thought that I would actually see this with my own eyes, and I think that's what I was stunned by when I moved to the Chatsworth area in northern Los Angeles when we bought the house here. I have my studio here. Often when there's clouds in the sky, I'm always excited to see what happens at sunset because the hills that are, I'm actually on near Santa Susana Pass, Santa Susana Mountains, they cast a shadow all across the valley. So my home is in shadow before the sun actually sets. And if I look east towards the Angeles National Forest, I can watch the shadow of my mountain range creep across the land and then up the face of those mountains. And with the clouds in the sky, it gives this really amazing, just vista, exactly how I remember it from the cowboy, the, the Western movies that I watched as a child. I'm pretty sure a lot of them were actually shot in this area. So... Um, it's amazing to, to see that with my own eyes and I always get really excited when the sun is setting like that and there's clouds in the sky and you get all these different colours and shadows on those mountains in the distance. It really reminds me of Edgar Payne's painting of the hills. So that's pretty much what inspired me to make this particular painting. In fact, I'm going to pull up a couple of images now of Edgar Payne's paintings as an example for you. So here's an excellent example of Edgar Payne's work. This obviously inspired the painting that I'm working on right now. As you can see, it looks very much like the hills that I can see from my house. Especially with that foreground shadow and the hills lit up in the background. And Edgar Payne, what I love about his work, he used so many greys in his paintings. Like that whole back mountain is just greys with just edging towards different temperatures in the shadows and the lit section. Coming up here is another example. I guess this one is painted a little later in the evening. So you get that... Uh, warmer light on the mountains in the background so it's fairly clear you can see the inspiration I took from Edgar Payne's work when I was com compiling this or putting this painting together it's funny because I actually found these photographs of Edgar Payne after I made my painting so I didn't really have them in mind while I was making the painting but you can see now in hindsight how much of an influence his work was on making this piece. So I used that grid to sketch in the basic outlines of the trees, the foreground hill, that mid-ground mountain sitting at the base of the, the range there, and then the line across the top of the mountain range with some of the clouds. And I'm just working up my value study because as, I, as I've mentioned a number of times in the past, you know, getting the values right is the most important part of the work, in my opinion. Making sure, because it's the values that give it its realistic effect. And then you match your colours and hues and temperatures and saturation to whatever the value is. On this particular occasion, I'm just using a burnt umber to get those values in relation to each other. It looks a lot darker 
on the video and that's just because when I first started filming this it was a white canvas so that's what um, my aperture was set to. When I start to actually block in some of those colours it'll make a lot more sense. I used the ground, the earth red ground as my mid-tone and then I brought down the shadows in the foreground area on those vertical trees and all the land that's in shadow at the bottom um, and I left that tone the ground in fact if you noticed I wiped away some of that ground to reveal some of the the lightness in the sky which is obviously the brightest part of the painting and I'm thinking in terms of four values pretty much So I wanted to bring up a little diagram from Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting in the top right corner. And these are his principles of value based on the plane. And occasionally I, I just think about this as the principle to start with. And for the most part in the daytime, my images usually fall neatly into these principles. I wanted to give this as an example that Occasionally they don't. If I'm painting a snow scene or a beach scene, then it turns the um, angles and the value study on its head a little bit. And because this is a sunset scene and we've got some portion of the landscape in shadow, it's slightly different. So our sky definitely is our highest value. But because our ground plane is actually in shadow, so that's generally what would be considered the second lightest area because it faces, it's perpendicular to the light source. On this particular occasion, it's in shadow. So our ground plane is actually darker than our angled planes. And you have to bear in mind that those angled planes generally are third value. But because the sun is so low in the sky, they are also almost perpendicular to the light source now. So in a way, the principle still stands, but it isn't in the same way that the ground plane and the angle plane would be if this, the light source was higher in the sky. So I've got my painting blocked in value. This is probably, I think, day two, and I'm starting to lay out some of my paint using the titanium white. That was a little quick. <laughs> That's going to be my cadmium yellow. So that's my warm yellow, which again I sell at the store, my online store, in both small and large tubes. This is the Hansa yellow, so this is what I consider to be a cooler yellow. This is going to be my cadmium red, a nice stable warm red, warmish red. And then my cool red is the Elizarian crimson. Um, I do use a little bit of that earth red on my palette, uh, so it's not part of the primary, but I, but I like to use it for washes. My warm blue, my violety blue is the ultramarine, and my cool blue then is the thallo blue, which some people shy away from because it's so powerful. I feel that the ga gamelin have a nice balance in that thallo blue um, so that it isn't too overpowering. I'm using lean medium to block in my colors. Lean medium by Class Chelsea Classic Studios, which I also sell over at my store. Right at the end then, sorry to go through so quickly through it, the time lapse has sped it up more than I was intending. Um, there's a burnt umber right at the end, just to kind of neutralise any of my shadows. Burnt umber has a tendency just to take some of the saturation away in the darker tones if I need it. And it's also a good starting point if I wanted to mix a colour, um, a, a darker colour just go with the burnt umber and then I start to add cools uh, primaries to that burnt umber and then I'll have a substantial amount so I'm going to start just actually mixing some of the colors to the reference image I'm going to start with that those distant mountains just since that's the largest area making those kind of cool and this is my sky and I just want to make sure that I've got enough because in the blocking stage of actually that's going to be the highlight 
No, that could be this guy. I have to try and remember. Because he's moving so fast now. I have to make enough paint to cover the canvas. Quite often, if I don't pre-mix a sub-palette like this, I'm always chasing the colours and I don't have enough. Or I use it up real quick and then it's hard for me to match that colour. So um, I'm going to pre-mix most of the colours. Now this blue is that shadow, the tip of the shadow from the Santa Susana on the base of the mountains. So that's a very bright blue. I'm going to mix some greens. Again, these are the shadow greens. I think at first I mix an average mid-colour green and then I can make it darker and lighter or warmer and cooler as I start to block in those areas. So it's just finding an average colour for an area and mixing enough so that I can add and refine it when I need to. That's the blue. I was gonna I was trying something a little different. I wanted to bring a little bit more blue into even though the reference image doesn't show any of the blue of the sky, my plan was to try and make that area at the top a little bit more blue, which I do as I block it in, but I changed my mind halfway halfway through the painting. So right now just getting those colours and not thinking too much about detail, still following the contour of the land a little bit and making sure that I don't paint over my underpainted shadows. I'm letting some of that toned ground, oops, I think that was a mistake, letting some of that toned ground show through. And as I start to go to the mountains, as they recede away from the viewer, they're going to get a little bit cooler and a little bit lighter. And that's the tendency with atmospheric aerial perspective. The further away you go, the cooler they get in temperature and the lighter they get in value, with the exception of white. And you've got to try and think of the atmosphere being like multiple layers of very thin curtains. So if there's maybe 10 or 20 between you and the foreground, there's going to be 50, 60 between you and the midground, and then hundreds of those curtains between you and the distant mountains. So that's going to make it the, the coloured areas appear lighter. But it's also going to take away from any whites that are in the distance. It's going to actually knock them down and, and, and soften them. So white is the exception. Distant clouds are not going to be as bright as clouds that are directly overhead or as close up. So that's another principle that's, that's good to know. And because this painting is an evening painting, there's quite a few things that actually fall outside the realm of principle, standard principle. It's good to know the principles and choose when to use them and when they apply and when you don't use them rather than just shooting in the dark. So I would always advise making your decisions based on informed choices rather than just kind of being random. And I learned that when I was in the band. You know, some of my bandmates who were fantastic musicians, incredible musicians, and they played, they'd learned to play all by ear, so they didn't have any music uh, theory knowledge. They could just, they played by listening to songs and they were super proficient on the instruments. But then it got to the stage where I noticed we were just playing in the same keys all the time. So whenever I suggested different keys, it didn't fall within the realm of what some of those musicians um, knew how to form and play. And just having that understanding and choosing to, you know, knowingly stick to a certain key 
or being able to uh, uh, adopt and adapt different keys, um, I thought was really, really useful. And the same with painting, you know, you, you're better off knowing it and choosing not to use it than not knowing it and then just... Yeah, that'll just that'll only get you so far, I think. So, art is a lifetime study. I don't think you ever know enough to stop reading about it and exploring, and experimenting. So, I'm just blocking in, but I'm also tuning slightly as I go along. And I was surprised, if I'm perfectly honest by how much of the painting I was able to cover in this blocking stage. Normally I would just get the entire thing covered in the basic colours without any blending or any fine tuning, just get it all covered so that I could see the relationship between the colours and the values. And it's a lot easier then to see what needs to be changed and re re refined. But because this palette was fairly simple I mean how many colors did I mix like five colors five tones because it was fairly simple the majority of the painting there is in that purple hue including the sky and then you've just got the darker green areas in the foreground I was able to do a little bit of blending and refining on as I went along keeping my brush strokes really loose again using all my rosemary brushes that rosemary have kindly made a set out of a richard j oliver set if you're ever interested in using the same brushes as me then again you can pick those up at my website my richard oliver is a 12 brush set and it comes in a really nice waxed brush pouch as well check that out under the materials tab on my website the reason why I sell all of these products is I, I not not for pro, not for profit at all. I always try and match my competitors, the big art stores. My my goal is really just to sell products that I endorse, sell products that I've used for many years, and selling them directly to you and to other customers allows me to be able to share my experience and give any sort of. Uh, customer support firsthand on the products that I love and I use. So it, it wasn't a money-making opportunity. It was more about saying, I love this. I stand by the company. I stand by the ethics of the company. Um, I've had a lot of experience with this. If you buy from me, I'm more than happy to be here to help and support and advise and give you tips on any of the things that I've been using and that you've been buying because of my experience with that particular product. So that's the reason why I chose to sell these over at my store direct because so many people were asking me what I use, what brushes I use, what paint I use. I was like, well, look, it's all here. You can get it in one place. You can get it as a set. You can, and I'm here anytime to help and advise. So I think that that's, um, I wish I had access to that as I was developing my career and developing my uh, my own technique. So I'm sticking to those values, staying with the upright tree in the foreground as being the darkest area, those angled mountains in the background being my in the mid values, and my sky is going to be slightly lighter. So I made a change, which I'll point out as we go along. The sky in the reference image is a very similar hue, colour and temperature to the mountains. And while I'm blocking in, I'm going to keep it close to the reference image. But I have to admit, with the exception of the blue sky, I have to admit that sitting with the painting on the second day, I wasn't so keen on how the sky, there wasn't much differentiation between the sky and the mountains. The mountains didn't really stand out. 
so I chose to alter the colour of the sky. A little bit of artistic licence went in and changed the colour of the sky to separate that background area and to push it back. I actually made it a lot cooler than what I'm making it here. So right now I'm just being extremely loose and expressive with the brush, blocking everything in. And the first experiment I made with this piece was with the little bit of yellowy blue above the clouds at this block-in stage. I choose to make it pretty, um, a pretty cool greenish almost daytime sky just to give the painting some interest and I take that away the next day I'm like no that doesn't work so just keep your eye out for when that happens you know just trying out experimenting having a little bit of fun like these marks are really loose and I'm using the filbert just to push the paint around and in fact this entire session um, of blocking in maybe only took less than an hour so I was surprised and I ended up just kind of fiddling with the sky for much longer I don't know if you've noticed I'm spending more time on the sky than I have on the entire rest of the painting because I'm mixing all of these paints together on the palette I'm sticking with the harmony of the piece so I'm using colours from the mountains and mixing into that to colour my skies. I'm using little blocks of area from the the dark the, the darks from the foreground and the purples from the foreground to mix into my sky as well. So that enables even more harmony in the painting especially since I'm using that split temperature limited palette of primaries split temperature just meaning that I'm using three primaries yellow red and blue which are slightly warm and then yellow red and blue which are slightly cool um, and just keep it make it mixing all my colors from those six primaries still using the filberts by rosemary this part of my set just sketching out some of those bits of architecture in the foreground i say foreground i mean that house on the hill there is probably two miles away and that's why the mountains in the background look so big because this was photographed using a telescopic lens from my patio because I was talking then I forgot to mention the blue that I put up the top so as you can see that stands out that was just me experimenting and obviously nothing like the reference image but I just wanted to see how it would look so this is day three the blocking area is pretty much dry now to the touch because I was using that lean medium and I'm going to start to refine and adjust some of the temperatures now I'd lost I felt as though I'd lost those mid-ground mountains just a little bit I may be wrong this might may still be the same day that I'm painting but I felt as though I may have lost some of those mid-ground hills um, because they are blended just a little bit too much into the cool gray tones of the background hills so I wanted to bring up the saturation just a little bit so I'm gonna make those a little bit warmer a little bit more yellow a little bit more vibrant and that's what's gonna the, the actual 
value itself isn't going to change that much, but the saturation is what's going to bring it forward in the painting and sit it right there at the base of those hills. And I'm going to separate that saturated, warm saturated area, just catching the sunlight. And I'm going to make the bottom of the hills there less saturated, much more grey. That's what's going to bring those hills further forward. You see that I'm just using almost, almost a complete grey now mixed from those primary colours and in white. So I'm using saturation to create distance rather than value or colour. I want to bring out some, refine some of the, the shape of the mountains because it was real loose when I put it in. I've got to start to think in th in terms of 3D, you know, when when a hill, I've got to stick with the, the light source and think about the hills as actually rising up and what shape their shadow would be and how that would fall on the land. So it's not just a matter of having a couple of blue shadows running down the painting. It's definitely thinking about the contour of the mountain and following those shapes with what I would imagine to be their shadows because if you ch check out my reference image you don't see a lot of those blue shadows in the reference image so all of this is being you know invented and the refining portion i mean this is this is where you can you can take a, away from the painting by over refining taking some of the expression away or you'll change something and you'll be like meh that was actually better even though it wasn't correct even though it didn't adhere to the reference image exactly it felt better when it was more expressive so there's always a bit of a risk at this stage uh, that you can by trying to add some element you end up taking away from the fluidity and the expression of the blocking area. So it's a balancing game as well, knowing what to change. So I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to change at this point, I'm trying to separate the sky from those mountains. And I know I wanted to make the general feel of the sky a little bit cooler and I go right back in later on and almost change the entire color of the sky because it just didn't sit well with me just fixing some of those the saturation of that shadow I didn't make more of a feature of that shadow where real blue and I'm, I'm making up a couple of those ridges just to give some extra dimension to the foreground now, now on my reference image those hills have property on them so there's a couple of houses or like a village maybe spread out which is nice because it allows me to bring a little bit of light of value and coolness uh, sorry uh, warmness to that mountain and actually helps a lot with the structure of the composition and it really does start to feel to my eye that those mountains are receding into the distance rather than me looking at them as though they're just flat and perpendicular to the way that I'm looking I can feel them kind of going away into the distance just refining a couple of the shapes there 
I think this might still be the same day that I blocked in. Maybe I just had a bit of a break and I came back to it. So I'm just working on some of the shapes of the clouds. I'm trying to treat the clouds as though I would treat a landmass. Actually see the clouds as, as shaped objects. And you can see I was really unhappy with the brightness of the sky it was just drawing the eye up to the top of the painting so I'm dull in that sky right the way down by using its complementary color using more of the yellow adding more yellow and orange to the blue just to kind of tone it right the way down so it's come down in value and it's come down in saturation and it's definitely come down a lot in its hue and that feels a lot better but again it's still not perfect. Now some of those ridges and hills in the foreground, in the although the whole area in the foreground is in shadow, the planes at the top of those ridges that are pointing up towards the sky are going to reflect some of the sky, the blue of the sky back. So I'm just adding a little bit more of a cool edge to the green just to give some more shape and dimension to those hills so whatever's facing almost directly up to the blue sky is going to bounce more of that that blue cool lighter value back just fixing some of the edges there as those trees go down onto the valley floor Still using the majority of that green that I pre-mixed when I was blocking in. And I mixed that green using the cool yellow, the Hansa yellow, with the thalo blue, the cool blue, because I just wanted it to be in the foreground. And then I'll add just little bits of uh, the earth red to neutralize it, to desaturate it. So I have a feeling that I've stepped back away from the painting now just to have a little look at it, see how I feel about the sky, and I'm taking some mental notes. Getting a bit of distance, because this is a slightly bigger painting with it being two foot by two foot. I'm having to step back in my studio really to take it all in and see the picture as a whole. I feel like maybe I'd made too much of a separation between the mid mountains and the base of those distant hills. So I picked up a bit of paint from the foreground and I blended it in with the background. I picked up a bit of grey from the background, blended it in a bit with the foreground. So just moving the paint around, making sure to retain some of the harmony throughout the piece using the same colors in little spots throughout the entire painting just to tie everything together. I have a tendency to make my trees look too symmetrical. I don't know what that's all about, but... Oh, here we are. We're into day three. So this is day three. And I know it's day three because one, my paint is dry on my palette, so I'm going to scrape some of that off so it doesn't confuse me. Only a little bit. I'm going to leave some of the dry paint on this so I've got something to mix against. But I'm going to start using the Fat Medium by CCS, Chelsea's Classic Studio Fat Medium, adhering to the fat over lean. Now, fat doesn't mean thicker. It just means more oily. Um, and I'm... Mixing the sky, I've gone away and I've looked at that sky and it just blends in too much. I've been looking at photos that I'd referenced overnight. Now the painting's fairly touch dry now because of that lean medium. My goal is really to make a big separation between the sky and the mountains. And I'm going to give a bit of a spoiler alert right now. Um, this doesn't go well 
and I have to work much harder than I'd intended to fix the sky. I got lost in the sky, I took away some of the shape and then I added some shape. I'm using just the edge of a flat brush now with some of that fat medium and a little bit of the impasto liquid and I'm just just feathering the tops of the texture. So I'm letting some of the colors show through and I'm just letting the, the bluer paint just lick over the top. So I'm not blending the two colors together because the bottom layer is dry. I'm just feathering over the top. So that, you know, I'm just ever so lightly How can I say, edging the temperature of those clouds over to the cooler side so the mountains stand out a bit more. And it works a bit and then it doesn't work. And then I lose it and then I get it back and then I lose it and I get it back. So that feels kind of cool, but the oranges are not really working with the blues so much now. And you probably won't see me lose my temper with this because I was really excited about this. I was like, painting's dry, I'm going to come back and now I've got more control over it. I'm going to just change the value of the sky, not the value, change the temperature of the sky just a little bit. And then I'll go back in and, and it just didn't happen. Today was not a day where everything was going my way. Now, compared to with the block-in day, where it felt like the entire painting was almost complete, almost complete in that one session so yeah so I'm feathering over all of that pink and all of the red orange and now I don't like oops I made a mistake there so things are already not going that well so I don't really like what's happening so I wiped it away and I blended it in with a cloth and I'd gone too far and then I, now it just looks like a mess. So the thing that I liked about it was the loose brush strokes. And I've lost the loose brush strokes by trying to change the color. Maybe it was how bright that sky was behind. So I'm gonna make that a bit darker. Something's just not happening for me, not working. I'm not happy, um, so I'm just working with trial and error right here to to get that sky to work now. Because I've put blue on there, the orange is standing out like a sore thumb. And now my whites look grey and everything looks muddy and I'm getting a little bit frustrated. So just so you know, it's not always smooth and formulaic. Sometimes you've got to wrestle with something to get to a point where you're happy. And for me, with the sky, it was getting a balance between the defined shapes of those light and dark areas, getting a balance between the color temperature, and making sure the painting um, as a whole the sky itself is balanced with the rest of the piece. So even though I'm happier with the color of the sky now, I'm not happy with the shape. I've lost my shapes. So I seem to be going one step forward, two steps back. Quite often, I literally walk away from the piece and have to come back with fresh eyes because when I'm frustrated or struggling, I'm not particularly thoughtful. And 
I started to lose some of the shapes. And again, same with my trees. What tends to happen with my clouds is every thing ends up just looking symmetrical, like the curves, the shapes, the angles, all end up subconsciously mimicking each other. So I changed the brush up, started using a fan brush because I was wondering if that was what's causing it. Now everything's gone gray and that didn't work so I wiped it away again. Now that's also a nice thing about letting it dry with that lean medium is that I can wipe it away. So I was thinking that maybe I went too dark with that blue sky in the background. And I've almost completely painted over the sky. <laughs> Starting again. I did like... Oops, I made a mistake. I think that's probably when I threw my palette knife. in a temper. <laughs> I did like the expressive quality from the day before when I was putting those grounds in. But I didn't like the temperature and the colours. So this needed to be done. I'm starting to think in terms of the shapes that are in the sky there. And I'm like, right, I have to bring back some of those clouds thinking about the light source and thinking how it would how it would fall on those mounds and humps and clouds and trying real hard and consciously not to repeat patterns and angles and lines and make it look very unrealistic I'm starting to get somewhere now so it blend in some of that purple that's on the bottom with some cooler highlights. The blues are now starting to work a bit better with the pinks and the reds. Starting to get a little bit more shape to my sky. Something really nice happened. Um, top left corner, I ended up lightening the blue sky in the background and it gave me a silhouette of clouds that were not in the reference image and it really helped me define the shape of the sky as though the clouds in the very top portion at the left hand side end up kind of being in the shadow of the clouds in the foreground. I'm really not a fan of the clouds over on the right hand side right now. They look like cartoon clouds. So I'm just blending with a knife. Keeping it loose, taking it, like defining areas, taking it back, redefining, wiping. I felt as though it was too defined. Something's still not working for me. So I've probably painted that sky now four times. <laughs> and clearly I need to do more sky paintings. More cloud ba uh, based paintings. I've not really focused on clouds. I'm always got my eye on the landscape itself. And I think moving forward I definitely need to get more experience working with the clouds. So this is where I added, again, I neutralized the blue in the background. I didn't like the shape of the blue. And when I did that, I was like, oh, actually, you know what? That looks quite nice. I, I, just making that shape a bit more random. And then it made those clouds in the background seem like a silhouette. Uh, so I ran with that. I started thinking, well, if that's in silhouette, then 
these clouds on the other side are going to be more lit. Um, and right about now, it started to get somewhere with this sky. I think it was just that mark there. Which was maybe a little bit too much. And actually, while I wrestle with the sky, I'm just going to answer some of the questions I got asked the other day in my question and answer and something else I posted on Instagram. So we were talking about how you fade oil colours in the background of the landscapes. And I did mention a little earlier, it's more about making things cooler and lighter as they get further away and taking away the yellow. Things in the foreground have more yellow, more brightness, more saturation. And as you get further away, if you start omitting yellow from the painting um, from the paint it's it's much much better someone asked how long have I've been drawing and painting well I did my degree in fine art in university in the west of England I started that degree in 1994 but I was really doing a lot of painting in school from the age of about 11 uh, I recall my very first painting was a picture of a cowboy believe it or not um, while listening to Adam and the Ants. And my mum said, yay, one day you're going to be an architect. And that didn't happen. Somebody asked me what brand of oil paint I use, and I mentioned earlier that I use Gamlin. I used to mix my own Gamlin paints from powder and add cold, uh, cold pressed linseed oil, but that's pretty much the way they make it over at Gamlin anyway. So I started to, um, I returned to using Gamlin from the tubes and simplified my palette down to primaries um, almost following the Mark Carter uh, method of painting and ooh, the types of brushes I use for my landscape uh, when I want to be loose and free I'm working for holding the, the brush right at the end with my filberts because they really you're a you can be more expressive and loose with them I really like using the ivories by rosemary for my flats and then if I'm putting any highlights on there um, I need a slightly softer brush to make sure that I don't take any of the end of paint off and I use um, rosemary's evergreens for my highlighted areas and for putting on light colors over the top just looking back at the painting now i'm doing what i said earlier i'm actually working on the contours of the landscape and really thinking in terms of the actual shape of those peaks and what uh what shadow they would cast um if if they were the way they are so going back and forth between the painting that you're seeing in front of you and answering some of these questions Somebody asked where I was based, and are most of my paintings from where I live. Well, yes, I live in Los Angeles, so I paint the mountains in the Santa Monica mountain areas and the coast around here. Um, but I do often visit France. When I go back to the UK, um, now we have a tendency to go to France, north of France. We have a place in Wisson, so I get to paint all the poppy fields and the coastline up in the north of France. But we also now go down to Provence and stay with my sister and brother-in-law in Provence. Um, and I get to paint the vineyards and the absolutely beautiful countryside down there in Provence. I'm just so spoilt. I really am. And I adore it. It's just wonderful. Um, let's see if there's any other questions here. Yeah, that's pretty much all the questions. I did a question and answer on my Instagram live TV. So you can check out most of the answers that are to those questions and others on my question and answer. So I feel much better about my sky. Um, it didn't turn out exactly how I'd intended, but it definitely has the right placement within the relationship to the whole uh whole, what am i doing with my brush okay oh i'm on the telephone <laughs> that's funny okay um <laughs> i remember the call as well 
uh, it it sits where it should sit. It does sit as a sky behind the mountains now, and it's not impinging on that in terms of its color uh, and the value. So I felt I feel much better, even though it looks very different to my reference image, and it's pretty much all made up. It's got a proper relation in the painting as a whole. I'm just bringing out some of the highlights. I'm actually making the highlights. Uh, I'm, I'm refining some of the shadows and the shapes by using that flat ivory brush I was just talking about. But I bring out some of the highlights on the front of those buildings because they are just catching, you know, the light that's still in the sky from the horizon. Maybe not direct sunlight, but the white of the buildings are definitely picking up some of the bright dusk uh, sunset in light there and I think that makes a real impact on the image just being random with my marks impressionistic suggesting some of those buildings really trying not to draw the eye away from the focal point which is clearly the distant mountains and the shadows and that little bit of cloud is sort of hovering over the mid mountain that is snow on the peaks up there, actually, which is fantastic. And the paint in itself isn't quite as orange as it appears here. It's a lot more purple, so. I'm trying to make sure that the tree in the foreground has shape to it, even though it's a dark mass. Oh, there we go. There's the... The warm highlights make makes the front of those houses really pop out. Just picking up a couple of the light. I mean, those are going to be reflecting almost bright sunlight. But of course, as we talked about earlier, the further away you get, the duller the white is going to look because it has to. It's been diffused by the atmosphere. really got to be cautious not to make the tree too symmetrical in fact I'm working hard to exaggerate the asymmetry of the tree I don't want to paint every leaf but definitely want to make it appear to be in the foreground using dark tones just to give it a little bit of dimension and I'm enjoying because I'm enjoying my casein painting a lot recently which dries matte um, it's it dries almost I don't know if you've used an iPhone like color adjustment and you've changed like the black point on your photo editing well, casein painting kind of mi it mimics that. Your blacks are not real deep black. It almost gives it like an aged photograph feel. And I'm really enjoying that in my casein painting. So I almost wanted to mimic that a little bit in this oil painting. If you look at my reference image, I've lightened the black area of the foreground tree and I've brought the highlight areas and the shadows together. I've I've consolidated them to reduce the wide value of those so there's no real whites and there's no real blacks in my reference image at least and I've tried to avoid going real dark on that tree in the foreground it looks a lot darker here just because of the way that the video picked up but it's definitely not black there in the foreground it's much more harmonious a lot softer and I'm signing the painting, so I have to assume that I'm finished. Yep, there I am. Right, so here's the final painting. You can see those brush strokes in the mountains there. Uh, that's the gesso that I put on earlier. It really gives you a, re a, a deep texture, a lot of movement and feel. Um, I'm, I'm pretty happy with how it, the painting ended up. 
Uh, it took me three sessions. I would have think that the first session of putting the ground in and getting the values maybe took two hours. The second session probably took two hours. And then I fiddled in the refining area and that definitely took me between three and four hours just messing with that sky and just fine tuning everything. But here's the final painting. I hope you enjoyed this a tutorial demonstration. And please, please reach out to me if there's anything that you would like me to go into further detail about. I would be happy to do so. I really need to get your feedback. So um, if you are happy with how I'm explaining myself and what I'm explaining, reach out via email or text and let me know to continue doing what I'm doing. But if there's something else you're like, well, you only touched on that. I'd like to hear more about that. This would be more helpful for me. Please, please, please reach out and let me know so that I can include that in the next video. Thank you so much for your support. I hope you're enjoying the membership program that I've developed and I'm very much looking forward to adding more content, more live videos, maybe some downloadable files so you can print some of your own pictures, lots of things in the works uh, that are going to be excited, very excited about rolling out in due time. But for now, I'm Richard Oliver. Thank you so much for watching my demonstration and tutorial and take care. I'll catch you very soon. All right, take care. Bye. Mm -hmm.